again our class. We appreciate you being here this morning. We're still in the book of Hebrews. We're in the 13th chapter. That's the last chapter of the book. There's still a lot more we'll have to cover in this chapter before we'll be finished. Uh, I'm going to begin uh, this morning looking at it at verse 5. We've already gone through 5 and 6, and we'll really start at, at verse 7 for our, our lesson, but just wanted to get it back in context again. So let me read verses 5 and 6 with this. It says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And we talked about this sometime at length last week. Uh, the fact that, that God has promised us. That he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Uh, and that's a, that's a promise of God. And one of the many promises that he's made to his children. And it's the kind of promise that gives confidence to us. In fact, so much so that the writer says here that, that we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Uh, well, we talked a little bit last week about what man can do to us. Uh, a lot of Christians, especially there in the first century and, and after, suffered greatly from the different uh, prosecution, persecution that came against them. A lot of them lost their property, lost everything they had. Some lost their liberty and some lost their lives. And so there are a lot that men can do to you. But what the writer here is emphasizing to us is that, that man cannot do anything to harm us spiritually. We cannot be separated from God, and God can't be separated from us uh, because of the love that he has for us. And so that's the thing that he's emphasizing here. We need to realize that and, and keep that in mind. And so, yes, Christians may, you know, lose their, their worldly possessions. But losing your worldly possessions, you still have God. He's not going to forsake you or leave you. So you've always got God with you. And so you know you haven't been forsaken. So your spiritual life is still good. And you know you still have that hope, that promise of God of life eternal with Him in heaven. It doesn't matter what men may do to you. We talked a little bit last week about uh, Paul's statements there in Romans chapter 9. Uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer that's expected from that is no one. No one can oppose us. No one can harm us, do anything evil to us spiritually as long as God's with us. And he goes on and talks about how there's nothing in all of creation, no power that can separate us from the love of God. And so we'll always have that. To, and that's one of the things we need to take comfort in. So because of that, <clears throat> we need to be careful not to set our affection on material things, not to be so concerned about wealth here in this life. That's the thing that he began with when he talked about that covetousness. Uh, you can covet anything. But that word that's used there specifically has the idea of coveting money, of seeking after wealth. So <clears throat> you can have that and you can lose it instantly. Uh, there have been so many times in history, uh, here in our own nation, back with the, uh, in 1929 when the stock market crashed. And uh, I, I can remember reading stories about things about that. People who were millionaires lost everything overnight because of that. And so if you've got your confidence and your hope is in the material possessions you have, you can be sorely disappointed in it because they can be taken from you very quickly. But the fact is that, that God can never be taken away from us. Uh, nobody has the power to do that. Now, we can separate ourselves from him if we desire. And one of the things that he's dealing with here with these Hebrew Christians is that some of them evidently are thinking about going back to that old law. They're leaving Christ and doing that and going back to that old law. That's the only thing that can separate them from God is when they make the decision to separate themselves. But otherwise, that, that we can know and be assured of the fact that God is always going to be with us and we have that confidence in Him. So that's, that's the idea behind that. Now, when we get to verse 7, where we're really starting today, he, he's dealing with the, the idea of avoiding apostasy. Uh, and he's going to talk about that throughout this whole chapter here, verses uh, 7 through 17 here in chapter 13. And so I want to begin just looking at, uh, at the first verse there, verse 7, and talk about that for a minute. He says, first of all, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. It's interesting. He, he begins by talking about those who rule over you. And he mentions those individuals three different times in this book, in this chapter. 
Look at verse 17. Someone read verse 17 for us. If you got that verse, raise your hand and call on you. To, all right, Brother Darnell, go ahead. Okay, those who, King James and New King James says, those who rule over you. It's the same word that's used here in 17 that's used in verse 7. He's talking about those who rule over. Then you look down toward the very end of, of the letter, uh, verse 24. Uh, and there it says, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. So three different times in this chapter he's talking about those who rule over you. But there's something a little bit different uh, that's given here in verse 7. And if you look at verse 7, it talks about, it says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, because of that latter expression, consider the outcome of their conduct, or consider the outcome of their life, uh, as some of the other translations render that. It's indicating that these individuals he's talking about are people who've already passed away. You know, and he's saying, remember those leaders over you. Certain things about them. Number one, they're people who taught you uh, uh, the way to live, not just by words, but it says that. They've spoken the word of God to you. Uh, but also, uh, he tells them to follow their faith, follow their example in that. And so they, they, they've taught by the way they lived as much as by the way what they taught people. And that's extremely important here. We need to keep that. So he says, whose faith follow. Now, does anybody have a different translation from that? This, this is the New King James Version. It says, whose faith follow. Yes, ma'am. What does it say there? Okay, follow the example of their faith. Uh, the American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, I know too, that say imitate their faith. And it's interesting because the word that it's used there, uh, uh, the Greek word is a word from which we get uh, the word to imitate, to mimic, to mime. Uh, it, it's, if you didn't translate it, if you just transliterated it into English, it would have that, that idea of mimic. In it, to imitate them. So he's telling these people, you need to imitate these leaders you've had. Uh, and I think that's extremely important that we do that, that we keep that in mind. Uh, Brother John Gallagher told me just a few weeks back, the class that he's with, uh, when they were studying through chapter 11, all these great examples of faith that had been given. And John says that he pointed out to the class, you know, he says, right here in our own congregation, going back to when we were at Woodlawn and then at Roebuck and now here at Deerfoot, he said, you know, you can look at so many uh, great individuals who passed away but were men of great examples of faithfulness. Uh, you can think about people that we've lost recently. Uh, Brother uh, Brown, uh, one of our elders, uh, passed away. Uh, I, re I can remember when early on at Woodlawn, uh, Brother Brown was head of the uh, missions committee at that time, and he was one of the deacons in the church. And uh, he had a great influence over me, uh, especially in regard to the, the mission work doing down in Belize. Uh, I can remember the help he gave to me uh, on trips down there and the encouragement he gave. And and later being, becoming a part of the missions committee and his leadership in that. Uh, tremendous. Uh, he also, when before he passed away, he came by the office there at Roebuck and uh, brought a couple of boxes full of books he wanted to give me. Uh, you know, it uh, helped me to keep on in my learning. And he gave to me. And he gave me one of his Bibles, too, that I have, it, that I use regularly. Uh, and Wednesday nights when I'm here giving the devotionals on Wednesday nights. And so, you know, he's had a great influence on my life. I know he influenced a lot of other people. And then there's Brother Jerry. For 44 years was our minister, but he also served as an elder, uh, as one of those who rule over us. And so, you know, 
the great example that he left for us. Uh, I, I thought so many times when I would have to go to Jerry and ask uh, advice from him about certain things. Uh, you know, because I just wasn't sure about something and, and, and talked to him about it. And he always had good, sound advice. Uh, and to see his example uh, and how he lived his life in times of problems or troubles that come into his life or, or to the church and how he dealt with it, you know, is remaining strong and faithful to it. And I go back beyond that to Brother C.C. C. Taggart uh, had a great influence on me in life. And Brother Taggart also left me some books uh, for me to use to study that have been a great help to me. Uh, Brother Ed Anderson, I uh, don't know how many of you might remember Ed, was an elder when we were there at Woodlawn. He was the first Bible school teacher I had. As a young man, I was 17 years old when I became a Christian, and I was in his Bible class. He taught the teenagers. And one of the things that he, he had us to do one day, he, he said, I want you all to remember uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I was a new Christian, so I didn't know any better. Uh, I thought, okay, I'll do that. But, you know, later, you know, people are going to think, man, the have to memorize an entire chapter of the Bible as part of an assignment, do that? Well, yes. And, and you know, and, and we all surprised ourselves that we were able to do that. And But anyhow, I just think about those men and kind of influence that they had on my life. And I think, you know, influence they had on many other people's lives. Those people who, who are now passed on. But we're being reminded here, as these brethren were that he's writing to, we need to remember those people. Remember those who rule over us, he says, who have spoken the word of God to you, that taught us the word of God, and didn't just teach us the word of God, but they lived it out in their own lives, the example they set before us. Uh, we can look at that and take great encouragement from that. And so that's the thing that he's emphasizing here, and he says, so whose faith you need to follow. And so I thought about that, you know, and John mentioned that to me. John said, you know, when he talked there in, in chapter 11 about those great men of faith, that he reminded his class of those individuals uh, in the congregation here, of the great lives and examples of faith that they lived for us, uh, that they had for us. But then immediately after talking about that uh, and how we need to consider the outcome of their life, that, that's what indicates, you know, they've now passed on. You know, they, they've come to the end of their life, they've passed away. But you consider the results of their life, uh, what it meant to them, uh, being faithful to God even unto death, that gives full assurance, you know, of the hope that they had throughout life, that they now have, uh, that life eternal with God in heaven that's being provided for them. So that's the thing that they're, they're commanded to do. Someone say something? Okay. All right, so anyhow, the next thing here. Uh, I've mentioned that three times I mentioned. Uh, they've taught us uh, by their example, and that's why he says, remember their conduct or imitate these individuals. Well, when, when I saw that word imitate, I'm an individual who, who's had a knack for being able to imitate people. Uh, and, and I remember some back in high school, the teachers that I had in high school, uh, I imitated uh, I, I'd see the way they would do certain things physically, and I found myself imitating it uh, without really meaning to do so. You know, I, I wore glasses like my teacher in physics did, and, and his glasses were like mine. It always slipped down. I grabbed mine. I'm always just about. But I noticed when he was, his glasses slipped down, he's always, that's the way he did it. So I started doing that. I didn't realize it at first. I was copying him, just mimicking him. And I did that throughout most of my life. And I got pretty good. I, some of them, I could mimic, mimic their voice. I could sound like them. And I did that all through college. Uh, people like W.A. Bradfield and G.K. Wallace. Uh, I got where I could imitate them pretty good. But, you know, that's not what the writer's talking about. Not talking about imitate what they're doing, you know, physically, the, the, the little habits that they have. But he says we're to imitate their faith. You look at the example of these men that we've talked about and the way they live their lives for God and how they live that life. That's what we need to imitate. We need to live a life of faithfulness to God like they did. Look at the examples in their lives at the times when they were going through troubles maybe that we're going through now. And how did they respond to it? What did they do? So you're looking for their examples. 
and to follow the examples that they had for that. That's what he's reminding us to do here in this regard. Now, he goes on, and the very next thing that he says, uh, well, after whose faith he follows, to imitate their faith, then we're told that Jesus, the very next verse, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when I looked at that in my Bible as I'm reading, I thought, man, that is such a, a, a quick transition that doesn't seem to connect. He, he said, remember your former people that had rule over you, your elders, and the way they taught you, and the way they lived. And then abruptly he just says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But there is a strong connection there. What's the purpose of bringing that up here at this point? That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sir? He's the greatest example. But what is it about him being the same? He never changes. And that's going to be a lesson he's going to draw for us from that. But you think about those men he's told us to remember. Those who had the rule over you who passed on now, you'll remember their example and to follow their example of faith. Those men are gone. We don't have that example before us, living before us now, because they're gone. But he wants us to know the greatest example we have is Jesus Christ, and he's never taken away from us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We'll always have Christ is our example to follow. We'll always have him there. Not just an example to follow, but, but the one there is our great high priest who's there for our benefit and is continuing to serve us in this life and doing all this. Now, uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That same type of terminology uh, is used of God in the Old Testament. And so that helps us to be reminded of the fact that Jesus is God. Uh, they're the same. Uh, yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus is God also. They would be reminded of that fact. But he's changeless. He's the same as he was yesterday, as he is today, and as he'll be tomorrow. So why is that important? Why is Jesus changeless? Well, we mentioned that one thing. that He's changed it because he's God. And God is changeless. Back in the book of Malachi, uh, the writer there, God says to Malachi, uh, I am the Lord, I change not. And so he's always going to be the same. He doesn't change. He doesn't change because he's God, plus because he's perfect. If you change something that's perfect, what are you doing to it? You're, you're marring its perfection. If you've got something that's perfect, it can't be any better, don't try to change it. If you try to change God, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to make him in something that's not perfect. That's why Jesus is changeless. And, and because he is changeless, one of the things that he's advocating to us here is to remind us of, we need to be careful that we don't change. And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute as, as he mentions that. But there's something else I want us to, to notice here in regard to this. That, uh, we've had those great leaders of old, and, and they're gone. But we have a great leader always in Christ who never leaves. Now, there's one passage in the Old Testament that's always been helpful to me in, in realizing this. And I've talked about it before, and... Uh, some of you maybe remember it, some of you may not, and it's always good to repeat things because Paul would do that because he said it was for the benefit of the others to be reminded of these things. But let, let me just point to a passage here in, in the Old Testament in Second Kings uh, chapter 2. Now I'm going to just read certain parts of this uh, to try to draw a, a lesson together from this. But in Second Kings chapter 2 verses 6 through 8, Elijah and Elisha are walking together. Elijah knows that God's fixing to take him away. And, and so he's walking along with Elijah. And, he, and he's told Elisha, uh, you know, you stay here because God's called me to the Jordan. And Elijah refuses to leave him. Uh, he, he's not going to do that. Beginning at verse 6 uh, of chapter 2 of Second Kings says, Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, 
for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophet went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So they, they've gone over the Jordan. A miracle's been done. They cross over. And when they're over on the other side, you know, Elijah says to Elisha, what, what do you want of me? And Elijah says that I might have double uh, the portion of your spirit. And, and so he said, well, if you see me when, when God takes me, uh, then, then, you know, your, your request has been answered. And so then suddenly the two are separated by chariots of fire. And Elijah is carried up uh, in, in those chariots of fire into heaven. And, and as he carries up, his mantle falls to the ground and Elisha picks it up. Now, later, we're going to skip a part of that. Later in the story, Elijah comes back over to where these sons of the prophets are. And, and the sons of the prophet speak to him. And they say, look now, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master. Lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send anyone. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send them. Therefore they sent 50 men and they searched for three days but did not find him. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Do you know what those 50 men were wanting to do? They wanted to find this great leader that they had just lost. This man who had been a teacher among them, a great prophet of God, who had sustained them and helped them. So, and now he's gone. And so they, let's go. Maybe God cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. So let's let these 50 men go and search for him. And Elisha, Elisha was opposed to that. But finally, when they shamed him, he said, then go. So they go and they search for three days, and they didn't find him. They didn't find him because God had taken him. And they come back, and Elisha told them, did I not tell you not to go? Now, with that in mind, go back to the part I skipped here in the story. Back to, to, to about verse 14. It says, now, talking about Elisha. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now I want you to see a contrast here of what's going on. You've got the sons of the prophets who are looking for Elijah. That's their great leader. We've got to have him back. We can't do without this leader. Let's look for him. So they spend three days looking, even though Elijah was opposed to that. Now, in the meantime, what's happened is the mantle of Elijah fell when Elijah was taken up, and Elisha takes it. And Elijah takes that mantle, and he walks over to the Jordan River. And listen to what he said. He said, where is the Lord of Elijah? The prophets, the sons of the prophets, are looking for Elijah. Elijah's not caring about that. He's looking for the Lord of Elijah. Where is the Lord of Elijah? And he strikes the river with that mantle, and he gets his answer. Because that river divides miraculously, just as it had done when Elijah struck it. And that does the same thing when Elijah strikes it. It's a lesson to Elijah and to all of Israel to know, Elijah is gone, but the Lord of Elijah is still here. And that's what we need to keep in mind. You've got these great rulers that we've been blessed with in the past that we need to follow their example, but they're gone now. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We still have Christ. It doesn't matter. You know, that's what we ought to be concerned about. Not, where's Jerry? Where's Jim? Where, no, where's the Lord of these men? And he's here with us and always will be. And so I think the reason that, that he gives is why he brings us in immediately about Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. These people need to be reminded 
You've had great leaders and they're gone, but you still have Christ and you need to remember that and, and keep that in mind. And so uh, I've gotten behind here on this. Uh, we have the one that remains to serve us and to do for us what the former leaders cannot do for us because Christ is always with us. Uh, Hebrews 1.12, go back to that for just a moment, says, Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. That's a quotation from the book of Psalms 124 where it's talking about God. And here it's being applied to Christ. And, and it's a second time here in chapter 13, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So reminding us about who Christ is, that he is God. Uh, since Christ does not change, then he's reminding his readers, you've got to be careful that you not change. Don't leave uh, this life you have as a follower of Christ. You have become a Christian. Don't go back to that old law and service to God as the Jews did. Uh, you stay where you're at. Do not allow yourself to be changed in that regard. Uh, so again, this reminds us that we have Jesus to help us always to be with us. Now, Hebrews 13, 9. He then tells them, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. And so he's encouraging them, do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. I like the way Brother Lightfoot suggested this. He says it means... You know, literally, don't be swept away from the truth as with a flood. You know, if a, a, a flood, can, you know, a dam collapses and the flood comes forward, and it can just sweep everything away in front of it. And, and so we've got to be careful, he says. You don't allow these strange doctrines to come in to sweep you away from your service and obedience to Christ. Don't allow yourself to be carried back away into that serving of God under the old law there. Now, Whatever this, this doctrine is, he, he calls it here a strange doctrine. Now, what, what does that mean, strange doctrine? Okay, it, it's something that's different. Sometimes that word strange is, is, is translated as foreign. And so he's saying, in effect, to these people, listen, don't be swept away by some foreign doctrine. A foreign doctrine is something that's totally different from the doctrine you've received from Christ. Uh, Christ has, ta has taught you and he's provided for you. So you don't allow yourself to be swept away from that to go back to that old law. You've got to trust in Christ and keep that trust in him and not allow yourself to be taken away. Now, whatever this doctrine is, and he doesn't specify this, it just says this strange doctrine, but it had something to do with foods. Look, look again, if you would, there at verse 9. He says, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Hmm. There's something that has to do with foods, and it may be disputes over food regulations. Now, who had food regulations? The Jews did. Yeah, there were certain foods that God had specified them were clean. You can eat those. There are certain foods that are unclean. You can't eat those. And, and so many of, of the Jews who became Christians probably were still having some problems with that. Peter had problems with it. You remember back in Acts when and Peter's going up on the rooftop, and, uh, and he falls into a trance, and he sees a sheet let down from heaven, and inside are all manner of beasts and creeping things, and he hears the voice saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And what did Peter say? Not so, Lord. <laughs> You're telling God no? Well, yes, because all my life, I have never eaten anything that was common or unclean. And the voice tells them again, what God has cleansed, don't you call common. Uh, and so those things are, are not forbidden to you anymore. But 
But that was a difficult thing for many of the Jews to accept. And so maybe it has to do with these food regulations that the Jews are familiar with, that, that they're being tempted to go back to, to this, I, I don't want to eat certain foods because it's contrary to what God had taught. And it's contrary to the way I've lived my whole life. There's a possibility with it. Uh, it could also be ascetic tendencies that were happening in some of the churches, even among the Greek churches. Uh, when Paul, for instance, wrote to the church at Colossae, uh, chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, Paul says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. There was something that was affecting the church there at Colossae. Uh, regulations here. Uh, and, and, and Paul says to them, you're acting as though you're, you're still in the world. You're subjecting yourself to these regulations, whatever they are. That, that, that includes you don't touch and you don't taste. So again, foods that, that, that you don't eat for some reason. You're keeping yourself from that. Uh, it could have to do with sacrificial meals uh, that some are, are concerned about these foods, whether or not they can eat it or not eat it. Uh, some things, you know, again, uh, you couldn't eat, but some things you could. Many of those sacrifices that were made under the old law, uh, when that sacrifice is made, parts of that animal is reserved to be eaten by the priest and by the ones making the sacrifice. The individuals who brought the animal to sacrifice, they, they would be allowed to eat of that. And they were required to eat of it. And so maybe these Jews are thinking about, you know, hey, there are certain foods here that, that I need to eat that, that have been sacrificed. Or there are certain things that I can't eat. If you're talking there about uh, foods maybe that have been sacrificed to idols. Again, it was something that had caused a problem for them. But whatever it is uh, that he's talked about here. He says in Colossians 2, 16, 17, do, not, or do let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Don't let anybody judge you in respect to the things that you eat. Don't let them condemn you because you refuse to eat certain things. Don't let them condemn you because you do eat certain things. Uh, why? Because those regulations are gone. Those things that you grew up under as a child of God, a Jew under that old law, those laws are no longer in effect. They've been taken out of the way. I was reading in the Bible the other day, and I came up on Don't judge, because if you do, God will judge you. Yeah, you're going to be judged with whatever judgment you give to other people. But here he said, don't let anybody judge you in respect to these regulations you had under the old law. Those things, that law has been removed. Uh, and so you can't use that as a means of what should or should not be done. It's all a matter of grace versus food. Uh, you know, there was a TV show I used to watch a lot, Man versus Food. Well, this is grace versus food. You've got to make a decision. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay with God's grace that's been granted to you? Are you going to go back to that old way of, of certain foods to be eaten, certain foods to not be eaten? And that may be what's causing the problem. There, there's, there's this battle going on. And again, if you notice what he says, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. God's unmerited favor to us. That he's provided salvation and we've been saved by the grace of God when we become his children in obedience to his will. And so he says, it's good that your heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. When, when Paul talks about some of these things, he, he lets us know that those things under the old law, you know, you're not profited by doing that. Uh, but the Jews felt like they were. And so maybe some of these Jews who become Christians are, are still lingering on uh, to that. And, and so Paul is saying, listen, you know, it, it's, 
good. It's better that your heart is established by grace and not by foods. Because remember, he says, those foods have not profited those who've been occupied with them. To those Jews who've been so concerned and so meticulous in keeping those laws about the foods that they can't eat and the foods they can't eat, it hasn't profited them spiritually. That's not what provides for man's salvation. But you are profited by the grace of God. And so his encouragement to these people is, you've got to remain in the grace of God, which you've been called. You've got to remember and to continue living and serving God as you could. Again, go back to that passage in Colossians 2, but back up a few verses to verse 14. It emphasizes again. He says, having wiped out the handwriting and requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's for that reason, he says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, let no one judge you in respect to meat or drink or regarding a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So those old laws in regarding to the foods that you can and can't eat, that's been removed. You've got to understand, that's just a shadow. But Christ is the real thing. And so that's why you've got to be careful. Don't allow yourselves to be changed. Christ doesn't change. Don't allow yourself to be changed. To turn away from the grace of God into which you've been called and to go back to that old law and to those regulations about what you can and cannot eat. Today, all things have been made clean. And we Christians can eat any of those foods. Uh, I don't know about you, but just recently I've eaten some pork. You couldn't have done that as a Jew under that old law. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible. But you see, that law's been removed. And so we don't have to worry about that. We, we, we don't allow ourselves to be changed, but remain strong and faithful to God in the grace to which we have been called. And then the next statement that he makes here, uh, and this, this is kind of uh, hard really to, to understand, he makes a statement. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Uh, you think about this. We have an altar. Uh, and the first question that I bring up, what is the altar that we Christians have? And wow. In, in, in looking, researching through several different commentaries and books uh, written by our brethren and some written by uh, those not our brethren, it is unreal. How many varieties of thoughts that people have about what that altar is. Uh, and I didn't want to go through all of them because there were numerous ones. But what I believe that he's talking about is what I will, will mention. And if you have other ideas you want to express about that, that's fine. But to understand it, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. The word altar... First of all, and I found several that, that in and out of the church that agree with this, the word altar is to be understood as a monotony, metonymy. Uh, now, be honest. How many of you know what that metonymy is? Well, until yesterday, I couldn't raise my hand. <laughs> I had to get my dictionary out and find out what in the world is he talking about, uh, a metonymy. And, and here's what the dictionary said about it. I have to do this very quickly. Uh, it's a figure of speech that consists in substituting for the name of a thing an attribute of it or something which it naturally suggests. Now, let me give an example to help understand this a little bit better and then we'll close our lesson for today. Here's a statement I know you've heard before. The pen is what? Mightier than the sword. Well, the word pen there and the word sword there is metonymy. Uh, the word pen doesn't mean a writing instrument. The word pen there stands for what this writing is. It stands for the writing of the pen. And so that which is written is mightier than the sword. He's not talking about a literal sword used in warfare. But he's talking about what that sword represents. It represents force. So what we teach, what's written, is stronger in, in converting people, truly converting people, than force. You know, 
you, you can force a person to do something, but they've not really accepted it. They don't really believe it. And that's why I talk about, you know, the pen's mightier than the sword. Well, in this case, we have an altar. Christians have. He's not talking about a literal altar because we don't have one. We don't have a, an altar in the church building, uh, and, and we don't have an altar anywhere else, a literal altar. The altar here stands for what goes on an altar, the sacrifice. What's the sacrifice that we Christians have? Christ. Christ is our sacrifice. We have a sacrifice that those who serve the tabernacle, tabernacle are not worthy to eat. They're, they're not worthy to partake of the blessings that we have from the sacrifice of Christ. And so we'll, our time's gone. We'll talk more about this, Lord willing, next week. Uh, say more about that and look at some other things in regard to that. But uh, we'll be dismissed at this time. We've got about 18 minutes before our worship hour begins.